uh, we're going to talk about mostly, although blockchain is one area which we could talk about for four hours, but we're going to mostly focus on Bitcoin and cryptocurrency and token and tokenization, what's happening in the market, where's the regulation going, uh, how investors can actually find uh, investment opportunities, what's the market infrastructure. So this is more or less we're going to discuss in next 30, 35 minutes. Hopefully that's going to be interesting to all of you. And uh, that after that, we're going to wrap up. So as um, already been introduced, um, I'm the founder and managing uh, member of uh, Nabartham, which really means new money. Uh, previously, I was at PricewaterhouseCoopers and I co-founded blockchain efforts at PricewaterhouseCoopers four years back. I used to run a Bitcoin node since 2012 um, on AWS and then used to do a little bit of mining on Ethereum. So I have a long history of crypto and blockchain. Um, and then we in PwC, I predominantly fo focused on enterprise uh, blockchain efforts, uh, but never really shied away from the public blockchain and permissionless ecosystems. And now most of the time I spend is advising startups and investors and enterprise blockchain uh, initiatives, how to create strategy, how do you translate the strategy to numbers, what's the network governance structure, and so on and so forth. So that's a little bit about me, and I'm gonna start from Michael uh, to introduce himself, and then Manny, and then Jack. Good afternoon. Um, try to wake up the crowd here. We're talking about the most exciting market uh, to come around in 20 or 30 years. So I'm Michael Turpin. I'm the founder and CEO of Transform Group. Transform Group is a vertically, or rather horizontally uh, integrated uh, blockchain services company. Uh, really started with Transform PR. We're the largest, oldest uh, PR and marketing firm for the blockchain space. We worked with over 110 ICOs and about 250 blockchain companies, including exchanges like Kraken and Bittrex and other uh, mining companies, et cetera. Uh, we also have a, a Services division uh, headed up by Enzo Villani, former head of, um, of uh, strategy for NASDAQ. We have a, a events division, Coin Agenda, and uh, Token Match, and um, also have a uh, technology uh, services division. And separately, I'm a general partner at Alphabet Fund, which is 400 million under management uh, as a digital currency hedge fund. Manny. Great. Good afternoon. I guess they, as they say, they saved the best for last. So here we are. Um, I'm Manny Alejandro, uh, pleased to be here and, and participate in this panel. Um, I'm an attorney, um, I'm a partner in a law practice uh, called O'Neill uh, & Partners, and we, we have an office here in New York, we also have an office in uh, Washington, D.C., and we focus on traditional capital markets matters and, and blockchain uh, projects. So I spend a, a lot of time every day um, you know, focusing on, on business development and, and grinding through um, you know, assisting my clients and trying to facilitate clients in terms of client services in this very confusing, ambiguous regulatory environment we're in. Uh, prior to uh, working for this law firm, uh, I ran for uh, New York State Attorney General this year. Uh, from January to June, I suspended my campaign. Please vote if you didn't vote. Just a little friendly reminder, you have until 9 p.m. today. Um, and uh, previously in my career as well, I, I was, uh, a general counsel at a, a hedge fund uh, here in New York called Mana Partners, and uh, have some management consulting experience where, where we work together at PwC. Uh, probably my most seminal experience and foundational was I worked at NASDAQ for uh, close to nine years uh, doing compliance and regulatory work, and I was off also in the office of general counsel. Uh, I'm Jack Tater, I'm managing uh, director, managing partner of Doyle Capital Management. Uh, Doyle Capital Management is an early stage investor in transformative technology companies, many of them in the crypto and blockchain space. Uh, I've been involved with uh, crypto since 2013 when I wrote one of the first books on Bitcoin called What's the Deal with Bitcoins. I just recently wrote with uh, Chris Berniski the book uh, Crypto Assets, The Innovative Investor's Guide to Bitcoin and Beyond. Uh, I'm also now um, uh, editor of a... Uh, newsletter with Forbes called the Crypto Asset and Blockchain Advisor newsletter. Um, glad to be here with two very, actually three very uh, knowledgeable people. So they, we did save the best for last. I have to say I learned a lot from his book, uh, Crypto Assets. I haven't read your first book, but second one. That's all right. Nobody read the first book. 
Well, I had to write the second one. <laughs> no, this is really good. Um, I'm going to go back to Michael. Give us a sense of um, the current lay of the land of the crypto assets. I'm not calling it cryptocurrency for a very specific reason, if you can touch on that. And like Bitcoin, Ethereum, EOS, what's happening, ICOs, and just lay of the land, a couple of minutes. Well, there's a lot of misunderstanding and chaos in the market right now, um, which happens when you have a new asset class that uh, is, is um, you know, dynamic and uh, sometimes frantic as uh, cryptocurrency has been. I mean, many people are reminded of the dot-com frenzy in the late 90s. Uh, the difference is that, you know, when you had the peak of the dot-coms in, in 2000 spring, and then it crashed to about 90% of its value, uh, A, there were some great values like, you know, Amazon for four or five bucks a share, but uh, many of the other promising companies got killed in the crib by their board members. Uh, they just didn't want the embarrassment or the legal hassle. And many of them got sold for uh, less than money in the bank and uh, then, you know, got retooled and became successful. Uh, some just died because that's what happens in the startup world. Um, for all of the problems that were mentioned about ICOs and governance in, in the last uh, panel. I mean, one thing that's interesting when you actually have a true decentralized or tokenized network that does classify as a as commodity, and this is uh, something that with your new uh, Digital Currency Trade Association, we are going to try to have a, a self-regulatory bottle like a fin, um, um, organization like a, like a FINRA. Um, you, you do have, uh, unlike uh, the myths, there are actually legitimate um, tokens that pass the Howey test. And, but what's interesting is when you have these community-based tokens, um, there's no board to shut it down, which means they can actually go out of favor and then sometimes have someone else take over that, that completes it and they come back. As opposed to with equities, a lot of times you have uh, uh, dysfunctional boards that just simply want to get the hell out and you know write off the loss and move on to the next thing. So I think right now that um, we're at the bottom of a fairly predictable market curve after a 20x uh, run up in, in Bitcoin and even more than that in many of the all-time classes. But uh, if you go to Bitcoin at bitchoys.com, there's about 300 times that Bitcoin's been pronounced dead since uh, 2011, and it's not dead yet. So essentially what you're saying, we are the dawn of a new corporate governance, maybe. I think we're the dawn of a new asset class, and it's really an asset cl class that uh, has several different components, just like real estate is investing is an asset class, but commercial is very different than residential, which is different than REITs, which are different than you know all sorts of other derivatives uh, within. And you basically have Bitcoin, seems to be the first one that people go after because it's the longest history, the most solid performance, probably the arguably the, list, the, the least uh, uh, risk in a five to 10 year horizon. You then have uh, fundamental infrastructure tokens have done very well. You then have security tokens. You have, you have all these different classes that all have different dynamics. Right, right. So since you mentioned new asset class, and that's why I want to bring in Jack. So why is it a new um, asset class or super a asset class? And why is it multi-trillion dollar valuation? Well, in terms of it being an asset class, uh, this was something that we visited in the book. And it's a very big uh, thesis of the book is that this is its own asset class. And, and uh, Chris Berniski did a lot of work uh, with Adam White uh, writing a paper about how it fit the criteria for being an asset class. A uh, uh, number of different criteria, whatnot. But what we're seeing right now is it's obviously an asset class that uh, because, I mean, you can invest in it, you can, to a certain extent, value it. But more importantly, as an investor, uh, I think it's something that people can look at uh, as an option to alternative assets that are currently in their portfolio. And this is a very big part of what we did with the book. We viewed uh, Bitcoin because a lot of these assets right now, a lot of these uh, coins, as Michael mentioned, they don't have much history. So it's very difficult to say, let's go back six months and look at this and see how it's acting. Bitcoin, we have some data. So when we take a look at the data, I think what we find is we find something that is not correlated to the markets right now. And after the uh, crash of 2008, we saw the financial markets start to put alternative assets into people's portfolios. And it's our belief that, uh, that Bitcoin and crypto assets can fit that alternative asset sleeve. This is not something you put 100% of your money into, but it is something where if you've got the 5 to 15% in your portfolio, 
uh, you need to be taking a look at this. And I think the reality is for investors, whether they're individual investors or institutional investors, uh, you've got to take a look at this. There is market liquidity out there. This is something that we didn't have before. Pricing is clear. Uh, in fact, the uh, Morgan Stanley just recently came out this week with their report. They are also now taking the stance that this is yeah, it's a, true. It is true. And the, th the three things that they address that need to be addressed before it fully becomes an institutional asset class is custody. And I think we're seeing that with Fidelity stepping in. Yeah. Um, price discovery, and I think we've got we've made some market infrastructure coming up. Right, we've yep. made some uh, turns there, and then also financial institutions coming on board. Well, I think we're seeing that now, and I think we're right around the corner from uh, a Bitcoin ETF or more products coming along from the marketplace. Now, that being said, I know you asked about the trillion dollar, and that was kind of something thrown out there to me. Uh, let's understand it: trillion dollars. Uh, market cap means that right now we're at about a 200 billion. So we've got to be five times that. Uh, Bitcoin is right now 50, about 50% 50 of the market there. We've got about 2,000, maybe even some people have said even close to 3,000 uh, different cryptos out there. We've got to see a large increase in that market, obviously. Of course, we were at 800 billion in, in January, so that was four fifths of the way. That's true. Right. That's true. That's true. That's true. Mark. I want yes. to change gear a little bit. Um, Manny, give us a sense of where the regulation is um, across the board. We have a separate segment on regulation, but give us a very short version. Sure. So, so you know, Michael alluded to uh, this trade association that we founded called the Digital Currency Trade Association. And really the mission of the trade association is to put forth clarity or to strive to attain uh, clarity in a very ambiguous regulatory market and uh, regulatory regime. So, you, you know, I liken it to um, lanes. So the SEC has their lane, the CFTC has, has their lane. And a lot of times, you know, when new products come out, new technologies come out, um, the question is, where do they fit? Do they fit in one of those lanes or do we need to carve out a third lane? So, or a second and a half lane potentially. So the, the mission behind the, the DCTA, the Digital Currency Trade Association, fundamentally is to work with the key stakeholders, i.e. Congress, um, the Financial Services Committee, the Agricultural Committee, and the SEC and the CFTC and the states, and to work towards the common goal of getting clarity um, there's a multiplexity of the alphabet soup of, of, of what I'll refer to as various regulators and ver various regulatory regimes, which make things super complicated. So when you look globally and you look at token offerings and you look at the push to do token offerings in uh, offshore jurisdictions, meaning non-U.S. jurisdictions, a lot of times the, the token offering will be done in a jurisdiction that was able to enact relatively quickly very progressive um, virtual currency licensing requirements and, and laws and promulgate those laws very quickly because they, they have what I'll call a very flat government structure. I think the, co the complication here is the tension between federal and state. And on that point, I just want to mention uh, one thing. So the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency has a fintech charter license. Um, there's a couple of banks that are applying for it. Um, New York State, the Division of Financial Services, has filed a motion against the OCC because essentially what, what the concern is is that if you get a federally chartered bank license, you automatically uh, have, could, could have a license in a state. And what does that do to New York Bit license? The reason I'm pointing that out is from my perspective, these regulators are not working to move the ball forward to, to, to get a more, uh, you know, to a better landscape for us and a better runway for us, right? There actually is some turf war going on and, and that troubles me. And that's one of the things that we want to address with the trade association in trying to, um, you know, work with and educate the, the let's, stakeholders. Let's revisit that. And, and the right? SEC in particular yeah. has been, uh, I think, guilty of a land grab. I mean, the CTFC has been, uh, you know, pretty much saying we care about fair markets. You know, they don't go and inspect every pork belly. They just care that they're fairly traded. Whereas the SEC historically has said we want to look at every security. 
And um, you know, the Howey test is a 1946 Supreme Court decision, uh, sort of finding out what is and isn't a, a security under the 33 and 34 acts. So there's been no sort of updating for television, much less the internet or the blockchain. And uh, and Clayton, the the the, the head, uh, you know, the, one of the five commissioners and the chairman, has basically said they don't plan on updating; they're just going to follow it. There's four tenets of the of the Howey test, and this is what everybody has to answer whether they decide whether they're going to go out as a security or as a commodity, essentially. And to me, and I've talked to like I'm not a lawyer, but I've talked to like dozens of them and read the thing over and over again. I mean, to me, it really comes down to the fourth tenet. I mean, uh, Hinman this week said, "Well, we're going to come out with with plain." Uh, English uh, rules, but then he said, I guess we're going to take this token or whatever, which first of all is a scary sign when you say or whatever, they're tokens, um, and we're mainly going to be looking whether people are investing money and expecting profit. Well, that's only two tenets, because you can invest money and expect a profit um, in an antique or a baseball card collection or a rare automobile or a rental home, and none of them have to be filed with the SEC, nor does investing in gold and hoping it's going to go up in value. So, so let me pause you there yeah. for a second, because we haven't actually explained what are the different tokens are. Sure. So... Jack, just explain, and then we're going to go back to the regulation, okay? So I want everyone to be on the same page with respect to all the different types of tokens and, like, utility and the issuance process and all that. Give us a, how that happens, and then we can go back to regulation. Well, I'll, I'll go with the taxonomy that we used in the book, which actually uh, we've, we've seen some updating, and what we tried to do in the book was at least set a foundation. And part of what we tried to do was to have people get away from uh, calling everything a cryptocurrency, which is which drove us nuts, and people would say, "Well, you know, how do you uh, how do you compare Bitcoin and Ethereum? Uh, they do different things." And what we're now finding, and what we've seen, and Michael knows this from all the the coins that he's uh, projects that he's been involved in, every every project does something different. So they we found that there's a need to really classify them appropriately. So we call them, an umbrella term is crypto assets. Uh, crypto assets consist of cryptocurrencies, which are Bitcoin, or those items that are used for currency purposes, crypto commodities, and I'm not, and once again, this is not really, no one's really defined this beyond us. We've had some other taxonomies, so we're hoping that the work continues here. And in fact, the most recent one came up with 20 categories. Uh, the second category is crypto commodities, which we feel Ethereum fits there, which is a platform that you build um, applications on. The third one, which we call crypto tokens, and I actually saw somebody else use a, um, a, a term crypto projects, but they are more associated with the functional uh, dApps that are out there that we see, and that's probably where the majority of these coins are. Someone mentioned earlier uh, about Crypto Kitties, and, and a little bit after we wrote the book, uh, my co-author, uh, Chris Brinisky, actually thought that crypto collectibles was a fourth classification. But I think what's important is for us to recognize that we're still in an experimental phase. We're still learning about this. But also, you can't, you, you can't make a blanket statement around these cryptocurrencies or crypto assets, they all work differently and they need to be evaluated and researched on their own merit. And we're seeing that even more so now that we're starting to see security tokens come in. And how do you, how do you value security tokens versus crypto assets? So it's a continuing uh, area that we're hoping that more and more people look at. So I don't know yeah. if that... And, and yeah, from, that, from my perspective, let's go back to the regulation. From my perspective, uh, security tokens, I like to call them tokenized securities because you're not securing a token, you're tokenizing security, is a completely different class than, uh, than crypto assets because they're securities. I mean, they're, they're, they should be judged against the S&P and um, crypto commodities in all their various forms should be judged against gold and silver and other commodity assets. And again, to back to the four, uh, Howey test, there are four legs, I'll be real quick. You know, investment of money and ex expectation of, process, uh, of profit are the first and third, but you need to pass all four to be uh, regulated as a security according to the Howey test, uh, which goes back to the 1946 Supreme Court case of uh, the Howey Fruit Company that tried to do something similar to wine uh, futures, which are, are, are commodities, they're not SEC regulated, but they pay dividends instead of delivering you wine because oranges rot, wine appreciates. So is it fair to say that SEC really does not have jurisdiction on all kinds of crypto assets? I would make that position. I think a lot of people, including the CTFC, make that position. Right. And so, Manny, previously you mentioned there's a bit of a land grab going on because of different agencies. So how do you see, and it's 
I mean, I'll start with Manny, but how do you see this whole thing play out? Because you, you raised a very interesting point, like if we look at, you know, Singapore, Hong Kong, any other, like even, even UK, Switzerland, it's, uh, the regulation is very centralized, right. and they're moving faster. Now, for very design, there is a, the, the way US operates, like OCC, Fed, you know, ACC, CFTC, and even FINRA, and so on and so forth. Like, of course, we know who has what jurisdiction. Now we're in uncharted territory. So how do you see, if you have a crystal ball, this thing play out, given the categories Jack laid out, right? Commodity, security, tokenized security, and so on and so forth. Give us a sense. No, that's a great question. So effectively, how I see this playing out, you know, clearly looking at where we are and looking at you know, the crystal ball, where I think we'll be in the future, is I think the federal government needs to take a more active role. So I'm not saying we need total federalization of this, but I think this needs to be legislatively enacted, right? We need some updates legislatively, either um, you know, FAQs, some type of guidance, or actual new, new federal regulation. The issue is, from my perspective, is the SEC you know, it will claim that they're doing what they should be doing based upon their rules, as will the CFTC. The difference between the SEC and CFTC is the way they do rulemaking the CFTC is, is proscriptive. You do rulemaking, and the, and the CFTC is usually okay with it. The SEC, uh, and I've been involved personally when I worked at NASDAQ, when I drafted rules, is literally word by word by word with the SEC. And it's, it, it's, a, it's a drag. It's a very difficult process. The CFTC, you do a self-certification. You promulgate a rule. You're in, a, you're in exchange. You have, you have authority and autonomy, and you self-certify. You're pretty much done. So if you think of the different mindsets, that's kind of what we're dealing with. I think the problem is that no one really stepped up when the technology started to really boom and when things really started to kick in particularly with, with ICOs going a couple of, year, you know, a couple of years yep, back. Yep. And as a result, you kind of saw a land grab again where you, know, you had states saying, well, wait a minute, state rules apply. And then, then, and then the SEC and CFTC and then other aspects of the federal government. I mean, so what's interesting is you, know, you have Treasury involved in this, you have the IRS, right? So, so how does the investor actually think about it? I mean, I'm sure there are investors in this room who are actually getting you know, opportunities thrown at them and prospectus and what have you, is like, how do they actually look at it? How do they evaluate, like six months, one year, the yeah, clarity? You, I think you have to evaluate, uh, evaluate it based upon your risk tolerance and realize the level of you know, risk that you're, you're taking on, okay. irrespective of whether it's a security or a currency or a commodity, you have to you know, live with and, a certain level of, of risk tolerance. And like anything else, you have to look at the founding team. If it's a, if it's a DAP, for example, I mean, look to see how they're handling it, whether they're, they've got a top law firm uh, guiding them, whether they're uh, you know, going and you know, um, blocking U.S. Uh, on their ICO, which is a prudent strategy until these things get settled. I mean, how many people in the audience think the Beanie Babies should be regulated by the SEC. Anybody? Hands? No? Crypto Kitties are just digital Beanie Babies, that's right? True. And yet I could see somebody saying, oh, Crypto Kitty, that's got to be a security, you know? So, I mean, there's just simply a, a fundamental a misunderstanding by all forms of government in these early days about what this actually means. Um, if you looked at, anybody looked at the uh, hearings with Mark Zuckerberg about Facebook, yeah. I think probably half those senators were ready to shut down Facebook and make it illegal because they had no idea that such stuff happened online. Right. So um, imagine what they think about uh, crypto kitties and, uh, and dApps. Yeah, somebody asked me, asked me a question about digital baseball cards. Same thing as uh, you know, crypto kitties in terms of, you know, it's, it's different than a traditional baseball card, people trading baseball cards. It takes on a whole different level, but nonetheless, you know, I think there is a level of responsibility that falls upon us. And, 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 and what I mean by that is I think we need to be more proactive, right? I think we need to educate. And I think there's an opportunity for us to do that. This is the way I put it to people. Look, there's a window of opportunity. If we don't seize upon that window of opportunity, someone will make the decision for us. So I think it's incumbent upon us to be involved in the decision-making processes to the extent we can be. And I don't know what that is, but I think it's worth trying. Okay, and, th thanks. and this battle happened um, during the internet and during the social media days. There was a very important case in Connecticut where they tried to ban MySpace in Connecticut unless everyone could prove that they were not a child molester. 
and MySpace successfully defended it and said that it was an overreach of uh, state power to make everyone prove that they are not a child molester to be able to get an account. Had that gone through, there would probably be no Facebook if it got adopted by many states. In the early days of the internet, um, New York State, which of course is usually some of the biggest offenders in terms of overregulation, sorry for the office, I wish you'd won. Um, but, um, you know, the, in the early days, they literally, what became essentially replaced by blogs was this thing called the news groups. And these were these little underground things that people could write about anything. And they had these news reader, readers on IRC, you know, that, you, that people would just like write about everything in the moon, uh, under the sun. And it was kind of this sort of exclusive little thing because it took a news reader software. Right. Well, they found in New York State that there were six groups out of like 65,000 groups that had links to child porn. Literally, they shut down all news groups in New York State, and because Verizon was here, and um, and and uh, I think Bell Atlantic or someone else, um, they ended up globally shutting them down to their carriers, and that really killed off the news group forever. I want to come back to Jack. What we, yeah. what, we um, what we have to remember here is the reason that the SEC is getting involved is is to protect the individual investor, and I, I agree with everything that that Michael's saying. But what we also had is we had a situation where people tried to raise money for their projects, and when this was going on a number of, uh, about a year ago, uh, there was no education. People had no idea what the hell a white paper meant, what a white paper was supposed to be about, what the criteria was out there, and people just threw money. And quite honestly, a year and a half ago, you could have thrown a dart at any of the ICOs and you would have quadrupled your money. Okay, regardless of what it was. Now it's different because we've realized that there was a lot of cash grabs and a lot of scams that were out there and the individual investor needed to be educated or protected or whatever. And that's why we're seeing these types of things. I do think it's up to the community to recognize that there are scams out there, that there are proper ways of doing this uh, and that there is a need for education. When we wrote the book, the, one of the big parts in the book was to try and lay a framework for how to evaluate ICOs. And I want to talk about that. And I, I don't care if that becomes outdated or whatever, but at least it was, a, it was a line in the sand to say, here's a way to evaluate it. So that's exactly my question. Next question, you brought up evaluate. Tell us, um, starting with you, where should the investors find investment opportunities and how they should evaluate it? Well, I would, uh, there's a number of ways to evaluate uh, projects. You have to understand that each project is different. Each project stands on its own. Michael brings up a good point. You have to understand the team that's involved there. You also have to recognize these as businesses. I mean, we, we have encountered so many people that have come up to us and said, oh, Jack, we want to talk to you about our ICO. And I'll be like, I, I don't want to hear about your ICO. Tell me about your business. And if they can't get away from the way they're funding it, and not tell me about the business, then it's not a project I want to be involved in. I'm not talking, this, the ICO shouldn't be a mechanism for people to just fund an idea that they had and then run out and buy a Lambo. It should be about building a business in much the same way that every other business is there. So you should evaluate these businesses in much the same way. We're starting to get now, we're starting to get people coming to us and saying, oh Jack, let's talk to you about our uh, security token. It's the same type of thing. Well, tell us about your project. We want to hear about your project. It's, it's much the same way as evaluating a business. Competitive advantage, the team that's involved, the developers that are involved, how are they building the community, and there are a lot of tools out there. Then when you start to look at the crypto economics of regular um, crypto assets, that's even different from security tokens. Michael makes a great point that they should be evaluated differently. There is different criteria for security tokens. So there's probably going to be a need there's definitely going to be a need for evaluating how do you judge a security token versus a utility token. So all of this work is out there that needs to be done. So there's a so difference between the gold bar and the gold mine. Gold mining stock is evaluated on management, on productivity. A price of a gold mining stock can skyrocket if they find better production techniques. It can, it can crash if they find there's been financial mismanagement or all of a sudden they don't hit their yield the price of gold is gonna go up and down on different techniques. And so that's really the difference between a crypto asset, which really is more of a commodity, um, and it's, it's about usage. It, it's really about the top line only, not the bottom line. Ethereum's never gonna make a profit, but if it's used wild, wildly, 
um, and people are like reinvesting it, the price goes up. If, as has happened in the last year, people raise a lot in Ethereum and they're not using it as much, they're simply converting it into Bitcoin or dollars, the price goes down. It's a commodity. It's a crypto commodity that obviously, like gold, can be transferred into cash. But a security token, I mean, most of them right now are like funds and variations of crypto projects that decided for whatever reason that they, maybe their lawyer said, you know, gee, I'm worried about being a utility token. That's not going to be the majority of, uh, of tokenized securities in five years. It's going to be real estate uh, projects. It's going to be restaurant roll-ups. It's going to be fashion brands. It's going to be everything that, you know, would have gone public earlier in the pre sarbanes Oxley days, and they're going to be able to tokenize things from, you know, angel round on a Reg D up to a Reg A plus up to an S1 and have it tokenized the whole time. Right. I mean, the reason that you're getting security tokens is because there is this trend to tokenize real assets, but also it cuts down on the time to market. I mean, think about it. If Ian Musk, if Elon Musk, uh, Ian, uh, Elon Musk uh, could bring Tesla out as a security token versus how he did it, I bet you he would have done it. So that's a very interesting point. Um, so when you say time to market, basically you're talking about issuance cost being reduced. To what extent? Like, I've heard various numbers. So people say, if I'm in the securitized market, if I'm able to issue you know, tokens as opposed to actually doing the bond issuance, then the cost might go down 25, 30 bips. Well, you'll, and it'll come to market sooner. And the founders will realize more of their uh, ability to, to for an exit strategy. But, but is that a, I mean, is, is there a real, that's just the cost saving side. But the effort you have to put in to actually do that, does it justify? Is there a real ROI? We, I, we don't know. We don't know because we're at an early stage. Security tokens are very much an experiment. It's like saying, is the internet going to save anything over brick and mortar? We're so early. I mean, there was a Fair big point. argument that Amazon was smaller than any shopping mall in Cleveland. And you know, this, this was just a joke. Fair point. OK, I'm going to change uh, topic. Manny, tell us uh, the impact of token in global capital markets and capital flow inter, inter you know cross border capital flow like uh, easily vc money investing in middle east or china or something else happening yeah i mean i think i think it's tremendous right now right and i think my you know my big concern is is that you know i, I would love to repatriate you know projects that go offshore um, because of the reasons that we mentioned and you know figure out a way um, that we could bring things back onshore and you know derive the the benefits, the economic benefits of bringing things onshore. One is to gain jurisdiction. So I don't know how you gain jurisdiction by pushing things offshore. To me, you lose jurisdiction. Hear that, Puerto Rico? Start seeking out these companies and bringing them into Act there 20. Four percent. They, they, there you go. And 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 you know, with that being said, you know there are levels of best practices that could be adopted. Um, you know, so even though the regulation might be ambiguous, you know, it's got to pass the, the gut test, the smell test, right? In terms of, you know, do you want to deal with a scammy project or not? You know, I think some of these projects are pretty obvious in terms of, you know, questions that, that, that come up. With regard to the, the globalization, you know, I think it's huge, right? I think there are uh, countries that, um, you know, have very progressive legislation, as I mentioned, which, uh, you know, people, people are, you know, moving to in terms of doing projects. I think what's interesting um, is a question of, you know, whether or not the U.S. has jurisdiction over, and to what extent does the U.S. have jurisdiction over an ICO or token offering that you've done offshore? Okay. You know, so there's a lot of questions about that still. So, you know, even if you do a token uh, offering offshore and you're like, this is great, we did, we, you know, we did an ICO, no problem. Um, it remains to be determined in terms of, you know, to what extent the SEC or any U.S. regulator for that matter has jurisdiction to the extent you've done um, some type of marketing or promotion in the U.S., your servers are based in the U.S., your, your, you know, there's a lot of questions that are coming up, uh, you know, from a couple of cases that are being tried right now in terms of, you know, uh, the jurisdiction and the full reach of very, the SEC. Very briefly, okay, 15 seconds. Um, there are a few ICOs happened in Singapore in the low tax jurisdictions, right? And uh, anybody who wants to take this question, what is the tax implication today? Can you do, um, you know, the window, whether the window of arbitraging tax advantages has been shut down from whether the whether mass and HKMA have essentially written laws which have shut down those holes? 15 seconds, whoever wants to take it. 
I'm not a tax lawyer. There's a few in the crowd, but essentially, it depends whether it's 51% owned by uh, U.S. citizens or not. I mean, if it's not, you know, you can just still a lot of the old rules apply. Uh, if you are, you have the guilty tax. You got the, all sorts of stuff that just is is much tougher in terms of uh, the tax advantages of being offshore. I mean, some people go and structure them as foundations, so there's no ownership. Um, but there's 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 ways of having that if it's a DAP and it's centralized, thrown out. Uh, I'd like to shout out again to Puerto Rico. You can start a uh, 4% Act 20 there, uh, roll it out in Cayman, and then come back, and it's 4% tax if everyone's uh, Puerto Rico residents or if it's uh, you know majority controlled in uh, in Puerto Rico. So cool. I think it's getting more and more difficult to uh, fully derive the benefits of, of what I'll call like the tax arbitrage, um, and I think right now you know that a, a lot of uh, you know the projects are really under the you know the scope of the microscope right now. So you know I I I I would uh, you know plead ca caution in terms of you know if if this is something you're looking into, make sure you have strong tax counsel and and, and planning all the way through. I'll contact you. You know if, I, I don't know about that, but if uh, <laughs> if uh, you know you're audited, be prepared. All right. Um, the last segment I'm going to talk about is market infrastructure and investment services. So custody, fund accounting, and stuff. So I'll start with Jack. So what is the current uh, status of you know institutional level custody solutions, uh, fund accounting and other infrastructure and also you know trading venues where you can get depth of market liquidity uh, so that institutional money can come in and and feel safe and investor protection. What we saw over the last few years is Wall Street basically ignored or said nasty things about crypto for a number of years. They kind of realized that it wasn't going to go away. Uh, I've said many times before that the time that Wall Street will, the only time Wall Street will get involved is when they figured out how to make money off of this. And I think they're right now at the point where they have figured out how to make money off of this. Whether it's custody services, whether it's new products coming out, the existing financial um, industry is now figuring out how to make money in this. So they are flooding money into this through hedge fund, through custody solutions. We're already seeing it with Fidelity. Uh, you are you are very getting very, very close to a world where over the next couple of years, you're going to have a Bitcoin ETF. You're going to have portfolios of different types of cryptos that the average investor can buy. And you're going to see a crypto uh, analyst desk uh, at Goldman Sachs and all of the other firms out there. And then people will start evaluating this as, uh, as another asset and start talking about how uh, this can get into the regular investors, uh, 401k and other types of And investment. prior to the uh, ETF, I mean, one big reason why there was such a uh, a boom in in in, in altcoin funding and in the you know forex of things you threw at a dart part as an individual was the boom in um, digital currency hedge funds, um, eight billion dollars worth. So. Um, you know, as long as there was money from institutions pouring into hedge funds, thinking, oh, I want to put into this asset class, but I don't know how to store the keys. I, let, let, me, let, me, let me go with these guys who were at Morgan Stanley or at other places. And, um, you know, the, the only one, they're all pretty new, the only one who has a full one-year track record for the year was uh, Polychain, and they reported a 2,100% uh, <laughs> return for the year. So I don't know if any hedge fund, any category has ever beaten that. Um, and uh, Alphabet, the one that I'm a partner in, uh, had a half year, and we had like 900%, and after fees, I think it was 700-something. So obviously this year, everybody's not do having those do, returns. Do you do self-custody, or do you, are, are you using someone else? Uh, there, is, there, is, there is not self-custody. It's custody. Okay. Yeah, so it's regulated in Dubai, and it's uh, out of Caymans, and uh, oh my God, the amount of like, regulation they go through. But that's what investors want. Okay. And, and, I, and I think the, you know, we'll, we'll see more what I'll call mass adoption from the institutional side to the extent the community adopts best practices. So I'll focus on one area in particular, price, price discovery, price transparency, right? So like best execution, right? You will see more models of, you know, price discovery in terms of satisfying the needs of the institutional investor. So you won't see a one-to-one -one correlation, but eventually I think the model will move in that direction. If you really want that 
you know, audience, if you want to tap into that investor base, you're going to have to deliver things to them that make them comfortable or more comfortable. And, and pricing, for example, is, is a key thing that I think we could deliver upon as a community. Although there's no regulation, there's things that we could do before regulation is enacted. And I think that that's a clear one. Custody, we already talked about in terms of coming up with effective solutions. But there's things that we could do in you know, anticipation of regulation. We don't know when that timeline is going to be, but there's a lot we could do. Uh, just one last point on this. Uh, I presented to the OSC uh, about um, eight months ago for a uh, project, uh, uh, for a Bitcoin ETF project and a multi-crypto fund up in Canada. And the OSC is the Ontario version of the SEC. Their three concerns were price discovery, as you mentioned before, I think we have we're better price discovery, custody uh, services, and education that they wanted to make sure that the individual investor is educated. So all three of those aspects, I think, have to grow for the average investor to get involved in this space. Wouldn't you say price discovery is already there with all the hundreds of exchanges? I agree. Michael, I totally agree, but it's but interesting. Do you have the depth of market? That's the question. Well, you have a price, well, but do you have the depth of market? So if you, if you're, if you're, I mean, I grew up in PwC, I'm not a CPA, but you know, CPAs are worried about fair value. And fair value is essentially, you know, it has to trade in a, you have to be able to exit. And can you even exit something like IOTA? I'm just picking it up. IOTA can't even exit directly in dollar. There's no exchange where you can trade IOTA against dollar. No, but dollar, across all of them, it's $6 billion a day, roughly. So right. So the point is, essentially, it is very hard. You have a market price, but it is acceptable, whether it is acceptable, because it might not have a depth at all. And then how do you ascertain fair value? And then when you have to do, essentially, strike an app for a fund, right? I mean, it's one thing to actually put money, individual money, in, in these assets, which is, you know, which is totally fine, but when you're actually and putting institutional money or running a fund, you have to strike a nerve at some nerve. Well, the interesting point. thing, of course, is if, uh, you know, if, let's say if $300 million goes in day one of, of, of an ETF and there's $6 billion a day, that's still reasonable liquidity, right? Mm -hmm. if, and everybody's not going to want to sell the day afterwards if it goes up a little bit. But the thing is that if too much of it pours in, it's going to grow the size of the trading, it's going to grow the size of the, uh, of the overall market cap unless somebody's similarly shorting. And you have a product that Wall Street is make, making money off of. Right. right. So last question I have, only three sentences from each one of you. What are your top three predictions for 2019 in the crypto space, starting with Michael? Just for 2019. J okay. Just three predictions. Okay. So but Only three predictions. Okay, three predictions. First one, Bitcoin price. I think it's going to be flat until the ETF. Uh, it could be a little bit of a lift on the... Uh, uh, but for the most part, historically, uh, there's usually about a year and a half of, uh, of, of sort of slow moving back up from the uh, bottom of the crash, which with the possible exception of a, uh, uh, some flash crash, um, we should be about as low as we're going to go. And it's going to start moving up to the next halving. But I see $50,000 Bitcoin by the end of 2021. I repeated that a bunch of times. My last prediction long term was 10000 by 2020. And I think I beat that pretty well. I did that in 2014. That's prediction one. Uh, number two, uh, I think that um, the SEC will m make some stabs at rules, but they're still not going to be sufficient to, uh, to uh, keep driving uh, 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 legitimate utility tokens outside of the United States. And uh, number three, I think that uh, security tokens are going to uh, have a heyday as soon as uh, um, some larger broker-dealers really start to make, a, make, a, make markets in them. Okay. Thank you. Manny? So... Uh, no surprise, probably my, a lot of my predictions will be the same as Michael's. Um, but I, I, I'm, I'm confident that the SEC will approve Bitcoin ETFs in 2019. Um, I think you're going to see many efforts uh, from a legislative perspective. There's three proposed bills in the House of Representatives right now from Congressman Immer, Immer from Minnesota um, on lighter touch regulation. Um, with regard to token offerings. So I think we'll see some movement there. And the third thing is I think we will continue to see the frenzy. What we really haven't talked about, and it's a topic for a whole nother discussion, is you know, how do these things trade? So you do, you do a, an STO, you know, where does it trade and how does it trade? So I think you're going to see a big boon 
for broker dealers, alternative trading systems, ATSs in terms of the secondary markets. So if you're going to see a big increase in STOs, you're going to see an even bigger increase in you know where they trade. So I think you know the. There'll be a big demand for that over the next uh, year or so. Also on the CFTC side, you know, SEPs or, or DCOs. Uh, full disclosure, I'm actually advising um, one of those um, venues um, up in Canada. Yeah, I think the trend is starting from Canada and coming to U.S. The I agree. Go ahead, I agree. Uh, I'll stick with two um, predictions that I've made. Um, about two and a half years ago, I predicted that we'd see Bitcoin at 20,000 in 2020. So I'll stick with that. That's an easy one, I guess. Uh, <laughs> uh, I do think that we will see a Bitcoin ETF uh, in 2019. I've made that prediction as well. The other one that I'll throw out there to you is I do think that uh, you're going to see something happen with uh, a security token where either an existing company um, converts itself to, an, to a security token or an existing crypto, which really shouldn't be called a crypto, actually converts itself to a security token. So you're saying it's going to go from non-security to security because you can no longer stay as non-security. You have to survive as security. I think there are, I think there are a couple of tokens uh, out there right now that uh, probably aren't crypto assets, uh, and they probably are more like equities, and maybe they may figure out a way to become a security token. I don't know how that's going to happen or anything else, but it's going to be very, very interesting to see how the security I think token economy goes. is already in the process of doing that, because they went out before there was any regulation. They were paying dividends. They were kind of like the Dow. They got kicked off exchanges, and I believe they're now in the process of, uh, of securitizing and, and going on, you know, well, they, they're public, so they actually would go on, a, not an ATS, but a, they're out of, like, you know, Sl Slovakia or Slovenia or one, one of those Eastern European countries, so different regulations and different, on exchanges, but uh, they're looking to sort of really be, because it's not just ATSs, because obviously I think the big play is going to be when, you know, you get a, an equivalent of, like, NASDAQ or OTC markets having the equivalent of a name, like they did in the dot-com days, but they end up having the NASDAQ token market. When that happens, that will happen. I don't know if it's two years from now or 10 years from now, somewhere in that range, um, then you're going to have full, you know, sort of a bull market into security tokens. Yeah, and I do think, and I, I'm, Michael makes a great point, I do think that this is going to lead to some M&A uh, efforts out there with yeah. some companies that are doing that are have created platforms for doing security tokens get scooped up by a number of these financial firms to just process these oh that's uh, that's totally i mean everybody i mean i'm seeing you know new investment bankers are essentially being created which is which is hoping that that happens it already happened like chain.com got picked up by interledger so we're going to see a lot of uh in a consolidation as we I'll have a fourth prediction. I've made this a couple of times recently. I've, I've spoken a lot lately because of my uh, $225 million lawsuit against AT&T, which is another, another topic. But um, I am still a very big fan of the phone companies being the place that once they solve their little security problems, um, that they can be a huge driver of getting the first billion people on the blockchain. It's only maybe 30 million right now globally because if... If uh, <clears throat> Verizon, which already bought AOL and Yahoo, bought someone like Bittrex, they could immediately be KYCing 110 million people and then running TV ads saying, um, you know, switch to T-Mobile and get your first $250 of blockchain dApps free. So we are 10 minutes over, but I guess that concludes our panel and the conference. A big round of applause for the speakers.